Uh, our lead pastor, Joel, is out of the country. He and, and about 15 people from Harbor are in Greece right now. I don't know if they're watching or not. It's like 6.30 at night. So uh, they're probably doing other things. But if you are, Joel and the team, we love you guys. We've been praying for you all week. Uh, yeah, we can give it up. Uh, if you get a chance, pay attention to our upcoming church emails or to Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we'll have tons of updates on some of the cool things that God has done and, and is going to do during the rest of their trip. I hope that you'll keep uh, praying for them. And it's just been, it's been exciting. I feel like there's a lot going on here at Harbor. Uh, we've taken two mission trips this summer. I, I feel like just the summer in general, man, it feels like people have sort of relaxed with COVID, even though it seems like maybe there's another, another wave coming. Uh, how many of you have enjoyed getting out uh, over on the weekends, just enjoyed the awesome summer weather, man? Just, uh, just an exciting season to be able to travel again. And, and even to think about what's coming up, it's hard to believe it, but we are at five years here at Harbor. The, the church has been around for, for five years. Anybody been here? I haven't been here since the beginning. Anybody been here since this thing started and kicked off? A couple of you guys, right? The, uh, it's, it's amazing to see what, what God has done through Harbor and, and where he's brought us through the last five years. And we're just thankful for that. We're going to celebrate over the next couple of weeks. Uh, on August 22nd, we're throwing uh, what we're calling the Harbor Block Party. We're just going to celebrate God's work here at Harbor and some of the really cool things that he's done that night. We're going to support a ministry called Generate Hope, which is committed to helping women be, be healed and restored from, from sex trafficking. Really excited. All, everything that's given that night is going to go towards that ministry, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, but life, life just seems good right now. And, and there's a danger uh, for all of us when life is good. I don't know if, if you deal with this, but when life is good, I tend to just sort of pull, pull off the pedal and relax a little bit. When life is good, all my bills get put on auto pay. Uh, when, when life is good, I don't really, really worry about, about the little things, right? And I can, I can tend to become complacent uh, and, and selfish. And, and whenever we become complacent and selfish, it seems like disasters just around the corner, right? Uh, it's just the way life works. I was looking at reading the, a book called The Autopsy uh, of, a, of a Deceased Church, looking at, at the, the markers of a church that, that uh, isn't very healthy. And it's interesting how, how true this is, how when we become Become complacent and selfish, we, we can sort of stop the work of God uh, in our lives if we're not careful. And, and I thought some of these were interesting. Just, just read a couple of them for you. The first, first is that when you're, when you're in a dying church, one of the signs is that the past becomes the hero. Again, you've, you've accomplished so much. Life is so good that you sort of get on autopilot, right? You, don't, you, you just think about what happened in the past rather than what God's calling you to in the moment. Another one is that the church stops praying. You just begin to look around at everything that's going on and you begin to say, hey, look at what I'm doing, right? Instead of thinking about the reality that, that this is God's work in your life, you begin to think that it's all about you, that you accomplished it. The church becomes driven more by preferences than by needs of the community, right? It becomes self-focused uh, instead uh, of community-based, looking at the needs of other people. And the last is that uh, they lose sight of their God-given purpose, right? Uh, I, I think that this is... This is so true, not just for us corporately, but also for us personally. Uh, we, can, we can very quickly, when we become self-focused and for, forget God in our lives uh, and begin to forget the needs that are around us, we can, we can live small, selfish, self-centered lives. And, and I, love, I love the passage in Philippians chapter 3 where Paul is sort of talking about all that he could stand on, that he has accomplished uh, by the power of God, all that he has as a Roman and Jewish citizen, which, which made him a pretty powerful powerful person in that day and age. And, and he has this statement that I think is just so great. He says this, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, uh, is calling me. Essentially, this, this idea that while he's thankful for what God has done, while he's so grateful for who God has called him to be, he, he knows that his work isn't finished yet. He can't live in the past or just put things on cruise control and put things on auto pay and just sort of mail in the rest of his life. He has to remain focused on who Jesus has called him to be. There is for, for Paul here, and I think for us today, individually and collectively, there, this attitude that there is no stopping now. This attitude that, that really, a, and I think this is so true, a compelling life is, is three things, fixated on Jesus. We read that in Paul's statement. 
that it is filled with purpose and, and ultimately that it is focused on others. A selfish life is a small life, right? God has called us to so much more. And and as we look at this, over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about who God has called Harbor to be. And it's gonna culminate, like I said, on August 22nd, as we just celebrate. Uh, But I think the the mission of Harbor is so so applicable to our personal lives. I think this is is gonna apply not just to us as a church, but to us individually. Really, this three-part statement that we are called to welcome home the hurting that we want to equip and launch the called and that we desire to make Jesus uh, tangible. I love that last statement. It, it really, it, even Joel, like traveling to, to Greece, I think, I, I think it encapsulates the gospel so well and it really encapsulates Joel's heart so much. The guy just wants to be doing stuff. He's been looking forward to this Greece trip for, for months. It's the longest I think he's never been, hasn't been out of the country because of COVID. And so I'm excited to, to cap that off as he speaks in a couple of weeks. But today we're gonna talk about welcome home the hurting. And I love this idea. I want to be a part of a church that welcomes home people who, who are broken and dealing with life's issues and hopeless and hurting. People who, who, who walk in and maybe aren't welcomed anywhere else in, in society, uh, but are welcomed here. And it really, it really does. It, it speaks to the heart of who Jesus is. We see this throughout his ministry where, where everyone who, who was an outcast and, and driven away by everyone else was welcomed by Jesus. He, he touched lepers. He, he spoke to adulterous women. He, he ministered to the outcast of society. And there's a statement in Matthew chapter 11 that that so perfectly represents this heart of Jesus. To to welcome home people uh, from the outskirts, the the, the fringes of society. And it's in Matthew chapter 11, and it starts in verse 28. And we know based on the context that there's a a wide variety of people in in the room as Jesus is talking. There are the people, as as Joel likes to say, uh, who've who've been ridden hard and put away wet. Uh, I know that that's sort of a weird statement, but I've heard Joel say that at least a half dozen times, right? Like you can just see as they walk through life that life has not been easy. And everyone knows knows it, right? They've gone through, through hard times and difficult times. No one wants to be around them. And these people are here because Jesus was a compelling figure who drew them in. There's also the people who, who, who were the religious leaders, who, who looked like they had it all together, right? Who, who, who acted in such a way where everyone paid attention to them, who seemed to have the power and the prestige that everyone else wanted. But, but we know from Jesus' statements that they were just as hurting as everyone else. Uh, and going through, through really difficult uh, depressing times on the inside. And then there were the people who followed these religious leaders who, who tried hard to measure up to the standards that they had set, to the things that they had added to the law, to the expectations of society, and, and, and were just driven and, and unable to do so. And it's to these people, right, hopeless, uh, depressed, anxiety-driven, not that different than today that Jesus speaks up to and says, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And I'm so thankful that, that Jesus spoke here and uses words like, come to me that he invites us into his presence, that a holy and perfect God like Jesus would invite us to come near to him, that he, he is such an inviting figure. And that it's not just for some of us who measure up. No, it's for all. He says, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and he promises rest. I'm thankful that, that he, he invites us to take his yoke from him. This is such a welcoming, hospitable posture that, that Jesus takes. He welcomes everyone who recognizes their need, who, who acknowledges their brokenness, who recognizes that they don't measure up to find harbor and, and, and safety and a place of hope in the midst of a busy, driven, anxious sort of harsh world, he provides shelter in the midst of a storm. He provides rest, something that no one else can. It's why we desire here at Harbor to welcome home the hurting. But, but the reality of this, I think, is that this idea sounds really easy in practice, but, but the re- reality is, is that this is hard to do, isn't it? 
I mean, we, we just live in a self-centered, self-focused world. It, it's the loudest voice that's heard, right? It, it's the person who, who points at themselves the most that gets the most attention. It, 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 we live in a world of, of self-care, self-help, self-worth, right? Everything is about me. And, and some of these things aren't necessarily bad, but, but the, the thing I think we have to acknowledge is that, that when we are self-centered, it, it's often a sign that we're, we're broken. I think about myself in the last week. Uh, I, I ate the last... Uh, the last piece of cake, the last bowl of ice cream, and some of this is actually news to my wife, so uh, I'm sorry, babe, but the last bowl of ice cream, the, uh, the, the last piece of cake, and I ate the last biscuit. And that may not sound like a big deal to you, but in, in my house, my wife made these homemade biscuits. I may have stuck into the kitchen at like 10 o'clock and eaten the last one and not told her some of this, right? Like in the last week, uh, I may have yelled at my kids a little louder than I should have, and I may have ruined a perfectly good date night with my wife because I was a little grumpy. Like this, and this all, I, 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 I mean, this is just reality, man. This is me in the last week. Like, I'm a selfish person. I, uh, I am self-focused. I don't often think about the needs of others. And, and I think the, the reality, we often think about people out there as hurting. Uh, and I'm thankful that, that, that Jesus has rescued us from, from sin and selfishness and shame, but the reality is it's not finished yet. I still have issues. I'm still hurting. And we can often forget that we're still hurting. And when we forget that we're still hurting, we, we do great damage to other people because hurting people hurt people. Hurting people hurt people. And uh, I, think about, I think about this for us. If, if we were completely whole and and, and and really perfect, we would, we would never think about ourselves. And, and just, a, just a, an analogy that I, I was thinking about as, as I thought, went through this week, I, I broke my elbow a couple of years ago. Playing basketball, dislocated my elbow, the most gruesome thing. I didn't pass out from the pain so much as looking at my arm. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And I don't do blood well. Anybody else, you don't do blood well or, or bodily injuries. My wife's a physical therapist. I could never do that. Uh, I would pass out the first day. Uh, but uh, I, I never once looked in the mirror when I woke up for 30 years. And I never once looked in the mirror and looked at my elbow and said, man, that elbow looks good today. Like, uh, I didn't even think about my elbow. I was like, never. I never woke up and said, man, my elbow feels great today. For 30 years, I never thought about my elbow. And when I broke my elbow, when I dislocated my elbow, I thought about it every day. I knew every single bone and ligament and tendon in my body, and I almost failed in anatomy and biology in high school. Like, this is not my gift. But because I was broken, because I was hurting, I was focused on myself. And if we are going to be a, a community of people who welcome home the hurting people, we must learn to be selfless. And as I was, I was reading this, this passage, the, the, the problem we all face, right? Hurting people hurt people. This is true in the church. I, uh, recently, some of you may have listened to this. I realized yesterday, my, my sister's been listening to this. It's like the top 20 on, uh, on the podcast uh, charts. But there's, there's, a, there's a podcast series called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. And, and I don't have any desire to bash another church or, or to talk negatively of the church in general. But I think the reality is that, that we have more of an issue with hurting and, bro- hurt and brokenness than, than we realize. And it, because the podcast really examines this, this one church called Mars Hill, but really it's, it's a, a, a breakdown of all churches that we have a tendency to follow self-centered leaders, narcissistic leaders. That, that the reality is that we are often hurt uh, in churches that proclaim the name of Jesus, not on purpose, but unintentionally because we forget, we become complacent and selfish. We forget that we are hurting uh, and broken. And, and we often uh, unintentionally hurt other people by the way that we live. And this is sort of a depressing way to start a message, right? Like, hey, I stink, you stink, we all stink. But I think if we don't recognize this reality for, for us, we'll miss out on who God has called us to be. This, this harbor where people can find hope and shelter and rest, this, this place where anyone can walk in who recognizes their need for Jesus and be accepted. Maybe even at the beginning they don't. They just want to check this thing out and figure out who Jesus is. If that's you today, so thankful that you're here. And there's this, there's this moment, there's this sentence that Jesus gives us in the middle of this passage. He says, come to me, right? All who labor and are heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. But the reason why he can give us rest is so fascinating to me. I had missed this. I mean, if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably read this. But I missed this. The reason that we can approach Jesus is because he's humble. He's lowly. He's gentle at heart. 
It's because he's not all about himself, right? A, a humble person. This, this isn't a popular word in our culture, right? Because we love to point the attention at ourselves. But Jesus is approachable. He's welcoming. He's hospitable because of his humility. And a humble person is meek. They're gentle. They, they're, they really don't have a high opinion of themselves. They really don't have a, a low opinion of themselves either. The reality is a humble person doesn't think much about themselves. And that's Jesus. He is perfect. He, he, he's spotless. When you come to him, you see no flaws. He has no issues in and of himself that he has to fill, right? Uh, there's a passage in Philippians chapter two that says we should do nothing out of selfish ambition or, or vain conceit. He, he is, he's complete. He's not selfish. And, and he's always pointing the attention to someone else. We don't have to please him. But we're made right by faith, right? And this is what makes Jesus such a compelling figure. It's because of his humbleness, his humility, and his gentleness that we can find rest. And if we are going to be a church that welcomes home the hurting, it will be because we are humble in heart. It's the humble in heart that welcome home the hurting. It's humility that is at the center of a hospitable church. And that's what I want to talk about with the time that we have left. How do we live a humble life, right? This is maybe the most nebulous character trait that we could think of in existence. But there's a passage in Philippians chapter 2, if we flip back there, which was where we started at, that so perfectly describes this. And, and as I read this, I want you to think about it. If a church lived this out, I think that they would welcome home the hurting. What's at the center of this is, is verse four where, where it says, don't be, or in verse three, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. But in verse one, I love this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Isn't that wonderful? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Back to verse three, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. This is, I, I, I believe, a picture uh, of a hospitable church, a church that welcomes home people that are hurting, a church that's a harbor in the midst of a crazy world. And I just want to highlight a couple of things. I, I believe that there are three or four character traits uh, of a person that is humble, and there's a pathway to get there that's revealed in these words that Paul gives us. And the first thing I see is that a humble person is motivated by love. They're motivated by love. Check out that first verse when he said, with their four questions, that he asks. He's not trying to force them to do something so they, that they can be made righteous. He's reminding of them of the rest they found in Jesus, right? A humble person welcomes home the hurting. And he says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? He's reminding them of what Jesus has given to them, of the love that he has shown them. And, and he's pointing them towards him. You know, so often in life, our, our motivation determines how how joy-filled and content we are in something that we do. And we can tell the difference, right? When someone's doing something out of obligation. My wife can tell you this because I did something out of obligation this week and I didn't have a happy attitude, right? But she is the picture of the opposite to me. So, so 10 years ago, 11 years ago, we got married. My wife is not a sports person and I am. I like to watch it more than I like to play it because I'm better at watching than playing. Uh, but uh, she, I love Texas A&M football. Like you, you don't want to come in my house when there's the Texas A&M football or basketball game on because I don't look like a Christian. But my wife married me anyways. And 11 years ago, she did not want to watch any football or basketball games. Probably hadn't up until that point in her life. But because she's motivated by love for me, she watches every game with me. She actually puts on a maroon shirt and uh, hangs out. It's, it's the coolest thing. She, she gets the kids dressed up. Like, she's a great wife. And she doesn't do it because she loves football. She does it because she loves me. And she actually has a good attitude doing it. Like, when you're motivated by love for somebody else, you can do things for them in such a way where it's not even hard, right? Like, like the, 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 the motivation changes, so your joy in doing it changes. I bought tickets, the CU's playing uh, Texas A&M at, what is it, in Powerfield? It, it used to be in Vesco Field, right? Is it in Powerfield? And uh, in a couple of months, and I bought tickets with my dad, and she got mad. She actually wants to go to the game with me and, and watch Texas A&M beat those dirty hippies from Boulder. So, uh, <laughs> so it's going to be, it's going to be a great day, and uh, I can't wait for, I'm so sorry. I know so many of you love, love Boulder, but... Uh, uh, anyways, but it's going to be a great day. And she's motivated by love, right? That, here, and I think there's a reality we all have to face. 
Every single one of us is busy, right? Nobody has a, an easy life. We all have a lot going on, but the difference between somebody who's driven by vain conceit and selfish ambition and someone who's motivated by love is your attitude in doing something, right? I can do hard things. I, I, can, I can live a life of contentment and joy when I'm motivated by love for someone else. If I'm motivated by selfish ambition and conceit, you're gonna know it and it's not gonna be a lot of fun doing it. A humble person is, is motivated by love. I, I, the second thing I see when I look at uh, humble people in this passage is that humble people are all about the team. They're all about the team. It's not a cult of personality. You walk into a church sometimes, I hope, and, and Joel, is, Joel is such a compelling uh, a, a guy. He's such a wonderful lead pastor, such a nice guy. But I hope here we never become driven by a cult of personality. It's not about one person or, or who we're done. It's not about Joel or Ryan or Jordan or whoever's on staff. Man, this is a place where we want the glory of God to be seen. Where we want people to experience the rest that Jesus offers. And that's what humble people are, are driven by. In, in verse two, it says, then make me truly happy if you're motivated by love, by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. We, we, we don't care if, if someone else gets the glory, right? Be, because we're here for Jesus. We're motivated by his love for us. And so it's not about us when we serve. Uh, I, 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 love, I love our Harbor Kids team. I love our welcome team. The, uh, they show up hours before anyone else does. They stay later than anyone else does and they serve in ways that no one else sees. Not because, again, they're motivated by, by their own desires, but because they wanna love others. And, and the win for, for them, the win for us, is when people come in and they experience Jesus, right? The, uh, my favorite person on any team, uh, in football, it's always the offensive linemen because they're the unsung heroes, right? Like for the Nuggets, I think it's Will Barton and some of the guys like him. Every, every good team has someone who serves behind the scenes, never gets any recognition, and does sort of the dirty work uh, that's, re that's required for a team to win. I always, I always love these people. And humble people could care less about their individual stats. It's about unifying together and working together. I, I, and the last one is that I see, a hallmark of a humble person uh, is this. They're focused on others. In, in verse three, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others, right? This humble, this selfish ambition, vain conceit. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. There's nothing more inviting than someone who is really, really focused on you, right? Who asks you a ton of questions, who thinks that you are, are a better person than them, who, who, who truly cares about your life. I think this is maybe the most hospitable thing, the most welcoming thing that we can do is be focused on the needs of other people. And I look at my favorite person in the world to be around is my dad. Uh, and uh, it's not because he's my flesh and blood. He's actually not my flesh and blood. He's my stepdad. And uh, best friend, uh, I think he's actually watching right now. So what's up, dad? But uh, uh, I, love, I love being around him. And the reason I love being around him, when he was younger, he was probably the most, he was in construction for, for 20 years. One of the most driven people that I've ever met. If you crossed him, you would hear about it. I heard about it quite a bit growing up. And uh, 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 yeah, it was, it was ugly at times. And and, and my dad is, is such an amazing person today. He's always been a great guy, but I've watched him when he interacts with other people. He walks into a store or they're traveling the country in an RV. He, he comes to a new RV park. He gets to know the names of all the people around him. People that he, he may not even uh, agree with ideologically or politically who might not look like him. He gets to know their names. He finds out who they are. He gets to know what needs they have. I've, I've watched him buy things for people that, that uh, just blow me away and do things for people and serve people. He, he doesn't care about himself. He's focused on other people. And he is such a compelling figure to be around, kind of like Jesus was. When we are focused on others, drawn to us, right? But the reality uh, of this, as we look at this passage, as we think about the humility and the fact that it's the humble in heart that welcome home the hurting, the fact, as I said at the beginning, is that this is a lot harder than it seems. And humility is the one character trait in our lives that we can't be just by trying to be humble. Right? If I want to be strong, if I want to be like Jordan and have big muscles and, and be super, well, first of all, I'm too little for that to ever happen anyway. Like our sound audio engineer, Travis is laughing. Dude, he's, he's stacked too. Uh, I, I, wish, I wish I could be that big. It, I mean, uh, but that's, that, that has no place in this message. We're, this is about humility, not me. <laughs> 
But uh, man, if, if you want to be big and strong, right? I mean, if you want to be huge, you got to go work out, right? And, and you can become strong by lifting weights and doing what you need to do to make that happen. If I want to be really intelligent, if I want to know a lot of information, all right, I can take classes, uh, I, can, I can go to school, I can learn a lot. Um, it, it's really easy to make those things happen. But the more you focus on humility, the more prideful you actually become. Right? Isn't that interesting? The more, just try to be humble for a week and see what happens. Uh, come back next Sunday and tell me how it goes, right? You can't be humble by trying to be humble. The more you try to be humble, the more selfish you become. We have to shift our gaze if we want to be humble in heart, if we want to welcome home the hurting, if we want to be motivated by love, if we want to be all about the team, if we want to be focused on others. And it's this last piece that is the most important thing in this whole message. If we want to, be, if we want to welcome home the hurting, we must be awestruck by Jesus awestruck by Jesus. And, and, and Paul really shifts. He goes from practical. Everything's practical, the first four verses. And then verse five, he says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus has. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus has. And, and, and the rest of it is a hymn that we read during communion. He says, though he was God. You think about that with Jesus. If you would have seen him before his time on earth, you would have been awestruck and amazed. He was the most glorious being that you have ever seen, had perfect glory, perfect relationship with the Father. He was adored and worshiped. This is who Jesus was and is today. And though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He left what he had. He left the glory and splendor of heaven. And in Isaiah 53, it says that he had no form that we would worship him. Nothing externally that would, that would tell us that he was God. He looked, if he was sitting here today, you wouldn't be able to tell him apart. He was fully God and fully man when he, walked along, when he walked in the earth. But just by looking at him, you wouldn't know it. And instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he didn't just come as a human being. He could have been born as a king. He could have been born in royalty. He could have been born in comfort. But he took the humble position of a slave. 30 years in anonymity, nobody knew who he was, and three years in ministry where he served the outcasts of society, where he took care of people, where he served them day by day. It wasn't about him. He almost ran from praise, it seems like, when he was ministering on the earth. It wasn't about him. He was always pointing. He, he said over and over again, it's not about me. I just came to show you who the Father was and is. And as if it couldn't get better, right? It, it says when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross, right? He, he didn't stop at living a servant life. He died to himself. He had no need in and of himself. He came to satisfy our needs. And it's by focusing here, it's by seeing Jesus in all of his glory and then in all of his humility and then in the way he served us, and then in the way he died for us, and then in the way, as it says at the end, that he's been exalted, that God has given him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's when we see these things that we recognize that, man, I, I am complete in him. I don't, I don't need to satisfy anything inside of myself. It's about him. When I recognize that, when I am continually, day by day, in awe of what Jesus has done, I don't need to be motivated by my own desires. I can love people. I don't have to satisfy anything in myself. I can serve others day by day. And it's as, as we are awestruck by Jesus that, that I believe we will truly become humble in heart so that we can welcome home the hurting. And as the band comes up, uh, and wraps us up. I just want to invite you in, in this moment to, to reflect on, on Jesus and all that he is. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. And I'm just going to read that uh, uninterrupted. It, it'll be the third time I read it, but I got to be honest, it's my favorite passage in scripture. So just go with me. Um, and it's going to tie in so well to this song that we're about to sing. This series is about no stopping now. Uh, this song is, is, uh, is all uh, about the glory of Jesus. It's all about the work that he is going to do. And may we never lose sight of him. May we never lose sight of what he's done or, or forget to be amazed at how wonderful he is. And, and if, if you would, you can close your eyes or keep them open. Just think through this with me. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. 
Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is worthy of being awestruck by, and he is who we worship in this moment.